Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Karema Mutlu. And on today's show, we welcome Andrew Miller, who's the Head of Price Assessments at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. How are you today, Andrew? Hi, friend. Doing very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Let's begin by talking about the lithium market. Has there been enough pessimism from an investor perspective for perhaps a new bull market for lithium to now begin? And what will actually drive this? The demand growth for lithium over the next couple of years appears only to be increasing within the lithium ion battery supply chain. So is the stage set for another possible run? What's your view on the lithium market today, Andrew? Yes, yeah, so I think we are sort of in this weird transition period in the industry at the moment where you do have these uh, double-digit growth rates, you know, in terms of demand. Um, you're seeing really still very strong demand growth, maybe not as strong as some people were hoping this time last year, but still very healthy, around 18% growth we're forecasting this year. So substantial growth in terms of demand. Um, what you have had is, though, after the, the real spike in prices in the run of the market over the past, uh, that began at the end of 2015, went through to the start of 2018, um, what that period really, you know, created and, and uh, led to was a huge amount of uh, investment going into the sector and a number of new mines coming into operation. Um, now we're at this point where we, we've seen the fruition of those uh, mines coming coming into the market. You start to see some products reach the market, and maybe that's uh, outstripped slightly the, the demand growth for this year. But as I say, in our estimations, we still believe this is a, a transition period. And when you're looking at longer term at the lithium industry, these double-digit growth rates are going to continue um, over the coming decade. Um, and to sustain that, you really do need continued investment in, in new mines, um, and you're also going to see, we believe, some volatility in pricing. Let's talk a little bit about the adoption of 811 nickel for high density batteries for electric vehicles. This now appears to be increasing. The trend does appear for car companies to offer more and more vehicles with longer ranges, which nickel obviously helps with. So is this shift happening more quickly than most analysts have been expecting for nickel? Um, I actually think it's probably, if you compare where a lot of analysts were, were pegging things this time last year, um, I really think actually it's been a bit slower than a lot we're anticipating. Um, we'd always been a lot more conservative on the uptake of, of these really high nickel, and by high nickel I sort of mean the NTM 811s or NTAs um, of the cathode world. We've always been a little bit more conservative for a couple of reasons on that front. I think one of the major reasons is, you know, the pathway to commercializations for new technologies um, in lithium ion batteries, it, it takes several years, um, particularly when you're talking about use in electric vehicles. Um, and I think you've seen some of that play out, particularly in China, where they were very aggressive on the rollout of 811 this time last year and haven't been as successful as they would have hoped in rolling it out. Um, you also have the cost concerns, and, you know, I, I think as a really where the industry is today with a huge amount of um, pressure across the supply chain um, for companies to, to maintain their cash flow. Um, you know, the margins are being tightened and ultimately people are looking at what they can provide as a lower, lower cost solution from existing infrastructure. Um, the problem with 811 and the really high nickel cathode technologies is typically the, the production um, uh, capacity, the, the the capital that's required to expand that capacity um, is higher than some of your lower nickel alternatives. And also, the, quite often, the, the input raw materials uh, can be more expensive as well. So I think a really interesting trend this year where many people were, were saying that LFP was sort of uh, was done and you weren't going to see a huge amount more growth in LFP as a sort of more stable, less energy dense, but more stable and established chemistry. LFP is actually growing quite considerably this year. Um, and NCM 811, although you have seen growth, um, possibly not the growth that a lot of people are expecting 12 months ago. Um, I think really in our models, we're looking at, you know, the mid 2020s, around 2023 onwards, when you start to see those penetration rates for um, the 811 uh, chemistries really, really grow um, quite considerably. Well, give us your views on the recent drawdowns from the LME nickel warehouse levels. On a five-year chart, you can see a steady drawdown, but recently the drawdowns have increased quite dramatically. So is this nickel being taken out of the warehouse to be consumed? Is there any way to confirm this? And what does this mean for the nickel price in your view, Andrew? So, so I think, yeah, when you look at that drawdown, um, you know, initially I think it was where that it was being used. Maybe there was some about um, expected growth. Um, so you can sustain this market, um, which was to account for that. 
uh, since that point, I think when you look at the volumes now, um, I've been saying, well, you know, from the LME, I, I really do think that you're, you're at a point where there is some speculation and you do have to start looking at what type of speculation is going. When you look at the companies that are they're obviously involved in that, um, I don't think it can just be demand driven from where the market is today. Um, so, you know, it's an issue, issue for nickel. Um, I think more, more importantly, and I think the bigger question for when you look at the battery raw material space is really, you know, what impact does, does something like an exchange have on these markets and the, the introduction of the platform for people to speculate? Um, I think that's, the, that's an issue that obviously the, the industry has been uh, tackling a little bit with cobalt for the past few years with the cobalt contracts that are out there. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of talk about introducing and lithium contracts as well. And I know that's a very big concern for some in the industry. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting trend and uh, an interesting case study, um, particularly with nickel sort of entering this, this period of major growth in terms of the nickel sulfate that's going to be used in batteries. Let's talk a little bit about graphite. Not much has been talked about this market for a while, but I understand you believe that there is a big demand coming for this. So can you talk to us about this? Yeah, the, the often uh, overlooked, I think, um, part of the battery supply chain is really the anode side of the supply chain. You, you, uh, people have been so focused for the past couple of years on on lithium, the cobalt intensity questions, um, the shift towards high nickel cathodes. Um, all of the technology development's been so focused on the cathode side that it's often been forgotten what's happening on the anode side, which is obviously the other crucial part of the battery. So um, I think graphite, when you look on the anode side of the market and you, you look at the, the range of technologies, the interesting thing is where you have this huge mix of different raw materials being used on the cathode side, you have your manganese, aluminium, your nickel, your cobalt, um, lithium, etc. On the anode side, effectively, really, you're talking about blends between natural and synthetic graphite. Um, now, there is longer term, obviously, development of silicon in the market, uh, lithium, LTO um, anodes as well um, that, are, that are being developed, but still a way off mass spec commercialization. And so where the market is now and is going to be in our models for the next you know, five to 10 years is really around either the use of natural or synthetic graphite. Um, now, the reason, you know, these have been, um, you know, overlooked to some extent is because people see the markets as, as being able to respond sufficiently to this type of demand growth. Um, they're to really larger, larger markets than you're working with when you look at the likes of lithium and cobalt um, and more suppliers involved that, that would be able to respond to demand growth. But I think a crucial point that we try and point out to people is that not all types of graphite can be used in the anode. So you really have start have to, having to break that market down into sub-segments of what actually can be used to, to, to um, feed this demand in uh, lithium-ion batteries. Um, and, you know, really by, by volume, uh, graphite is, is the, most, uh, the most used in the lithium-ion battery, um, has the highest intensity. So it's a really important part of the lithium-ion battery. It's going to be a mainstay, as I say, typically between natural and synthetic, some blend of those two materials will be used in the market. And um, I think when you break, when you look into the, the graphite market in detail, you'll see that actually there's some structural issues that mean that the industry may not be as, as um, set up as a lot of people believe to respond to this rapid uh, growth in, in anode demand. Let's talk a little bit about EVs in general. Do you feel that we have reached a tipping point for the adoption rate of electric vehicles? And what could possibly stop this adoption? Is it a lack of charging points and infrastructure? Or are most consumers waiting for lower priced electric vehicles to hit the market? You know, I think we are close to a tipping point for passenger electric vehicles. I, I think we're already, you know, we're in the tipping point for um, some more heavy duty type applications. You know, e-buses have seen huge growth over the past four or five years now. Um, you see that happening as not just a trend in China now, as a trend in countries around the world. Um, again, China's led the way on the passenger electric vehicles front. But I think it's really important to, to look at how that market is diversifying outside of China now. Um, and you're starting to see increased adoption um, in, in, uh, in North America, in Europe, in other parts of Asia. Um, so that's going to be a really, you know, a really important um, thing to watch in terms of identifying exactly when this tipping point is. I think you just have to look as far as the, you know, the Western OEMs and some of the statements they're putting out. Um, you know, just a couple of days ago, we, we sort of forward announced the electric mass bang that they're going to be releasing. Um, we've seen the latest uh, 
Tesla Model Y be announced. And when you look at the the announcements and the targets of major Western auto OEMs, you see that the tide's only moving in one direction. And I think ultimately, if we're not in the tipping point now, we're going to see it in the in the coming two to three years, certainly. Um, what can hold that back or what can stall that? You know, I think there's a few factors. I, I, I do think you're right. You know, charging to a certain extent is something that there, there needs to be some more infrastructure built out, um, certainly, um, in terms of electric vehicles. Also, you know, the battery costs are going back to the raw materials and the inputs into a battery. We, we still do need to bring down that, that, uh, the cost of the battery, even though it's reduced considerably over the past five years or so. Um, there's still more gains to be made there in terms of improvements of the, the, the what you can get out of the battery. Um, so, uh, I think that there's improvements across the board that need to be made, but I don't think they'll ultimately hold up this shift towards electrification. Um, I think the, the foundations have been set now by, by major, major OEMs, by major battery producers who have made huge commitments to expanding their production to meet those needs. Um, so I think we're, we're in, uh, we're in this now. Um, and you're really going to start to see the, a more, uh, widespread uptake of electric passenger vehicles, um, over the coming years. Excellent. Okay. Well, talk to us about a few books that you would recommend for investors, Andrew. And have there been any books that have really stood out during your career to date? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think what, you know, one book I've read this year that, that certainly stood out to me um, has been the best book I've read in a while was The Bad Blood um, about the Ferrano scandal. And um, I think that has uh, lessons to be learned for, you know, for investors as well as people in the industry. And we see it a lot in the markets we work in, rapidly up and coming industries and, and the, the, the human um, inclination to sort of be led by big names and, and sort of not dig too deep below the, the surface in some of the and some of the research and the, the intelligence out there. So that for me has been some, a book I really enjoy. And I think that has lessons, like I say, across the, the space that we cover, probably for investors as well. Um, and for everyone in terms of a little bit about human nature. Um, so that's one I, I'd point out as, as one that stood out to me. And talk to us about your role as the head of price assessments for Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Give us an understanding of the data your team looks at and how do you come to a conclusion about a particular metal or commodity? Sure. So, um, you know, when we established Benchmark, Benchmark was founded back in 2014. Um, and since then, you know, the, the real goal of the business has been to collect first-hand um, information and data from the industry, from people active in the market, using our network of contacts. Um, to be able to, to gather that information and then verify it with other parties involved in the supply chain. Um, so that's at the heart of everything we do. Um, and my role, you know, is, is setting up the price assessments team. Um, price assessments are really at the heart of the business in the sense that they drive the data collection. Um, yeah, I work with a, a group of really talented analysts who are very dedicated to the market and look at the, uh, look at these things in real detail and are constantly speaking to the industry uh, to, to build up and stay on top of exactly what's happening. Okay. And as we begin to wrap up, Andrew, is there anything else you'd like to talk about with our listeners today? Any other markets that look interesting to you? Uh, I spend so much right time looking at the battery supply chain. It's hard to look too far away from that. I think, you know, when you look at the, the raw materials that we cover and the, the the key components of the lithium ion battery supply chain, um, they're very interesting as you're going to have significant growth, um, for a lot of industries from a relatively low base, um, over the coming decades. So I think there's going to be a, a huge amount of bumps in the road along that. There's, they're going to be of interest, um, going to lead to some significant volatility, I imagine, over the coming years. So those are areas that I really, um, I, I focus on. And then, you know, you look at some of the peripheral markets, they're, they're also going to benefit. Um, from this move towards electrification, um, in areas like copper, for instance, um, you know, there's a, there's, there's a huge amount of, um, knock on effects that this shift to electrification can have, um, in terms of other raw materials, in terms of whether it be autonomous driving and that, those type of areas. So, um, yeah, I hate to stick too close to the subject, but, uh, that, that's where we spend a lot of my time. So probably the first thing that, that comes into my head. No, no worries. Excellent. Okay, well, many thanks for your time today, Andrew. It's been a pleasure having you on the show today. Thanks very much, Karen.
think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip-your-face-off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?